think I will start with going around with introductions. So if I can ask Sue Manns to go first, please. Sue, so you're on mute, I'm afraid. You'd think after all this time I'd managed to work a mute button, but clearly forgot at that point. So I'm, I'm Sue Manns and I'm president of the RTPI 2020. And uh, just thank you very, very much before in advance for all the preparation you've done for this visit. And being able to fly between three islands is, is quite amazing in one visit. And it's one of the real positives that's come from this sort of virtual world that uh, that we live in. So I'm very much looking forward to it. And uh, back to you, Dawn. Thank you. Um, so we are covering Jersey, Guernsey and the Isles of Scilly today. So I think if we can start off um, with um, Kevin, please. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin Pinney from uh, Government of Jersey. I'm the uh, head of uh, place and spatial planning uh, in the uh, uh, in the government's um, strategic policy uh, uh, strategic policy team. So, uh, and uh, yeah, welcome to uh, to this virtual visit to Jersey, Sue. Um, uh, apparently, we were mentioned on the um, uh, UK weather um, reports yesterday for having the most amount of rain, but um, uh, it is actually sunny in Jersey today. So, uh, welcome to sunny Jersey. Thank you. And if we can go to Guernsey now, so Jim and Simone, I think Jim, if you want to start. Thank you very much. So, I'm Jim Rolls. I'm director of planning for the government of Guernsey. Um, the weather here is rather nice as well, although it's usually a degree or two cooler than uh, our sister island in Jersey. Um, so the department that I head up has um, obviously planning, building control, um, deals with protected buildings, etc. But here we're focusing on the, the planning side and I have with me Simone White. Simone, you're really quiet. Did you want to lean in? Yeah, this is a problem with our technology. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Simone White, Principal Forward Planning Officer with the Planning Service for the States of Guernsey. Lovely, thank you. And then finally, Arza Silly with Lisa. Yes, hello. Um, so we're not actually in the Channel Islands, we are um, uh, off the coast of Cornwall, but um, anyway, <laughs> that's a small point. My name's Lisa Walton and I'm the, um, I'm the senior planner here on the Isles of Scilly. I work for the Council of the Isles of Scilly. Um, we are part of the UK planning system, so I, I sit within the infrastructure and planning department and I focus on planning applications and planning policy and developing the local plans. So everything from enforcement, conservation and everything in between. So that's me. And it and and it is raining here today, and it feels like it will never stop raining, and the sun is not shining. Thank you very much. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to do um, three presentations. I think if we start with the first one, do Q and A's after the first one, move to the second and the third, and then general Q and A's at the end. If everyone's happy with that, so um, I think Kevin, if you want to start us off, please. Okay, that's great. I'll just try and um, share my screen. So hopefully you can uh, you can see that on your uh, on your screens. Okay, so uh, I was just going to um, talk about um, some of the work we've been doing to plan for um, coastal climate change here in uh, in Jersey, uh, and I've just got a short series of slides to uh, to cover that. Um, I wanted to cover. Uh, uh, four issues. So first of all, just to provide a little bit of context about uh, about Jersey, uh, then to talk a little bit about the particular challenges that we face around our coastline, uh, talk about some work we've done to produce a shoreline management plan, and then pick up on the planning challenges and responses to that. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of context about uh, about Jersey. Um, as, as you've already uh, gathered, we're the, uh, the largest of the, the Channel Islands. Um, uh, Jersey is about 45 square miles in area. Um, we've got a population of uh, just over 100,000, 107,000. Uh, and that's uh, the, the recent trend has been that that's been uh, continuing um, to, to grow. Um, uh, population and migration is quite a, a key challenge for us here in Jersey, particularly in terms of, um, uh, in terms of planning. Uh, dealing with the uh, the particular demands that place is on a uh, on small place. 
um, uh, we're a, a crown dependency, as is uh, as is Guernsey. Uh, so we're autonomous for all of our own domestic uh, matters, uh, and that includes planning legislation, uh, which was introduced in Jersey in, in 1964. Um, we've produced um, island-wide development plans uh, since the late 80s, uh, and we've reviewed that um, a couple of times uh, since. Uh, it's probably worth saying that our planning jurisdiction extends all the way to our territorial. Uh, uh, the limits of our territorial waters, uh, so covers terrestrial and uh, marine environment as well. Um, as you're probably aware, the financial services is uh, one of our key uh, industries here in Jersey, uh, generates about 40% of um, GDP and employs just over a quarter of, uh, of islanders, but um, our sort of more traditional industries of tourism and agriculture are still significant in terms of the um, uh, the uh, the island's landscape and um, uh, some of the uh, services that the island benefits from. So that's just a quick uh, overview of our, our, our context, which uh, is uh, appreciate a little different to the uh, to the UK. Um, in terms of particular challenges uh, uh, related to climate change, uh, Jersey's uh, 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 like the rest of the world, subject to um, climate change. Uh, impacts and uh, this is just some work we've done in Jersey to generate our own climate stripes we call them um, and this is really just a, a, a visual um, uh, manifestation of the impact of uh, increasing uh, global temperatures or sort of local temperatures um, generated by global climate change and this is a uh, uh, representation of um, uh, the air temperature or uh, annual air temperatures in Jersey compared to the 30 year average from 1971 to 2000, just showing that since records began in Jersey in 1894 in terms of uh, recording our meteorology, uh, you can see very um, evidently that the, the climate is warming um, uh, and uh, just looking at the particular impacts of that. This, this mural is um, uh, sits on a wall in St Helia, so is is something that uh, is a uh, uh, an image that islanders can uh, can see uh, uh, as a backdrop to uh, uh, daily existence in in St Helia. So it's quite a powerful tool to communicate that message to to islanders. Um, in terms of the implications of that for uh, Jersey uh, and particularly around our coast, is that um, uh, coastal flood risk is the uh, is the key issue for us. We've got no um, major river systems in Jersey um, because we're such a small place. Uh, so the key challenge for us is around coastal flood risk um, related to increasing sea levels and uh, wave overtopping. Uh, and obviously the uh, increasing incidence of um, storm events and the severity of those storm events uh, uh, is part of that uh, that challenge. Uh, so we've done some work uh, to look at the impact of that on the island and uh, in terms of sea level rise, um, we've used the, um, uh, the prediction that looks at a potential increase of 0.83 metres uh, to up to 20, uh, uh, 21.20, um, just to put that in, uh, in context. Um, why is that particular challenge for us? Well, uh, there are a number of reasons. Uh, and then the, I've just got a series of slides picking up some of the key factors. So, firstly, the topography of the island topography of the island is such that Jersey generally slopes north to south, um, uh, with our sort of south, uh, uh, south and east and west coasts, um, the coastal plains there being uh, uh, particularly low lying. Uh, and I'll, uh, why is that significant for us? Well, when you look at the distribution of population on the island. As you can see, St Helier is on the island's south coast, uh, and our highest popul population densities are in uh, uh, in St Helier. And then we've got um, uh, strips of development coming out from St Helier east and west, uh, again, where there's a relatively high density of development. Also an issue in terms of the makeup of that, that population, when you look at deprivation indices, um, uh, again, St Helier has the um, highest uh, concentration of um, deprivation relative to the rest of the island, so particular challenges for those uh, islanders and communities in that part of uh, in that part of Jersey. Uh, and of course, this also has economic significance. So I mentioned um, the island's dependent on its uh, largely dependent on its finance industry, 
um, and uh, we're in a global competitive market when it comes to that uh, that industry. Uh, and this slide just shows some of the work that was done at one of the economic forums at uh, Davos to look at some of the key challenges to global economy. And you can see um, failure of climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation is is top there in the uh, uh, in the list. Uh, extreme weather events also features quite highly in terms of its likelihood and potential impact. So, um, you know, aside from the sort of physical challenge um, to the island's coastline, uh, this is also something that obviously impacts um, decision makers about where they might lo might locate their um, global uh, financial businesses. So it's an issue that is of significance to um, the, uh, the island's economic well-being. Uh, I also um, thought I'd highlight the uh, spread of infectious diseases on this uh, on this slide too, which you can see in yellow. So um, uh, the likelihood wasn't uh, envisaged. Uh, that's particularly great at the time this uh, this work was done, which um, is interesting relative to where we find ourselves now. Um, but moving on, uh, in terms of our um, shoreline management plan and the island's response to this particular challenge around climate change and um, particularly sea level rise, um, the island's had a, um, a sea defence strategy for um, uh, a number of years, which was largely based on maintaining our existing sea defences. Uh, we've got a mixture of um, uh, sort of Victorian sea walls uh, together with some um, German um, uh, Second World War uh, structures, which were created by the occupying forces to um, uh, prevent, uh, largely prevent landings onto the island. So um, uh, the current um, or the previous strategy was based on simply maintaining those existing defences. Uh, but in view of the particular challenges posed by climate change, the island recognised that we need to do something a little more proactive uh, and start to um, take that more seriously and plan for um, uh, the challenges that that, uh, that presents. Uh, so what we've done uh, across government is to develop a, a shoreline management plan uh, involving um, colleagues from uh, strategic planning, uh, sorry, strategic policy, uh, our uh, engineering services, uh, and the, uh, the planning team. Um, and uh, this has been a useful piece of work to inform uh, coastal management, but also uh, it's it's feeding into our um, work that we're doing currently to um, review the, uh, the island plan. Uh, and so, as I say, we've um, uh, looked at that uh, uh, as a piece of work that's uh, addressed the challenges around the island's entire coastline um, and looked to develop a series of um, uh, assessments looking at the particular challenges um, posed for all of the island's uh, coast. As I said, the island slopes north to south, so it's not a particular challenge for uh, our north coast, um, but certainly around the island's um, southern uh, and eastern coasts in particular, there are some, some key challenges. And this slide just shows some of the um, potential implications of um, sea level rise and wave overtopping um, for those uh, those areas most at risk um, and as you can see a lot of that uh, equates to um, uh, the areas immediately east and west of, uh, of St Helier in particular. So in response to that we've developed a, a policy framework that looks at the island's potential response uh, and that's broken down into four key responses um, uh, and the, these are summarised on the slide here so really sort of no, no intervention um, where um, the uh, coastline itself, the natural coastline, can provide the defence that we require. Um, second response is about maintaining the existing defence line and that's um, uh, uh, simply um, seeking to maintain the existing defences that we've got. And then the last two are perhaps where the, there's most planning uh, uh, interest is around uh, adapting those existing sea defences that we have or looking at the option of advance the line. Um, uh, where we might look to create new sea defences uh, in advance of the um, uh, seaward of the existing sea defences. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So the outcome from the shoreline management plan is effectively a, um, a policy regime for coastal zone management, coastal defence uh, for the entire island. Um, the work that we've done covers three epochs, so um, it goes out to 2021, so it has a 100-year outlook, um, uh, but then also um, two um, epochs um, with a shorter time scale, first looking at a 20-year 
uh, horizon and then beyond that for a medium term, which is a 50 year horizon. Uh, and by doing that, we can start to prioritise the extent of um, uh, challenge for different parts of the island's coastline where uh, there, there are most risks. Uh, as I, uh, as you saw from the previous slide, the, the island's coastline is divided up into a series of um, uh, coastal units um, where we seek to provide a policy regime for um, the management of, of sea defences for those, uh, those coastal units and then look at um, the potential need for interventions over those three uh, those three time epochs that I talked about, and uh, you know as you can see um, uh, to the east and west of St Helier, uh, the current policy regime is um, looking to uh, adapt the existing defences that we've got or to potentially uh, advance the line in those locations. So that's the uh, that's the shoreline management plan. Uh, as I said, that's um, currently feeding into some work that we're doing. Um, to review our, um, our, our island plan. Uh, our current island plan was adopted in 2011 uh, and we're looking to uh, review that with a view to its uh, adoption by the current um, government um, uh, prior to um, the next elections in 2022. Um, so the shoreline management plan is, uh, is feeding into that work and we are, uh, as part of the evidence base for the island plan review, uh, we are um, undertaking a strategic flood risk assessment. So we're using the work both on coast coastal flooding and inland flooding to look at um, what implications that poses for um, the distribution of development across the island. Um, so it's much more integrated into our um, into our planning work now. Um, and out of that, we will develop a new planning policy regime to increase resilience to uh, to flood risk around the island. So it will become much more of a material consideration in planning applications here in, in Jersey. Uh, and um, that will be accompanied by new supplementary planning guidance to assist colleagues in development control, but also to assist the development industry here in terms of seeking to respond to the need to address this, uh, this particular challenge. But uh, as I mentioned, there's um, uh, and perhaps the most interesting element of the um, uh, the shoreline management policy, particularly for St Helier, is the uh, potential opportunity that that uh, presents, as well as the uh, the threat of um, increasing sea level rise and the challenges that that poses. Uh, and it's interesting to look at this from an historical perspective. Um, Jersey's not um, uh, things like land reclamation and um, the need to provide coastal defences is not something that's new here in Jersey. Um, over the last few hundred years, uh, St Helier in particular, the shape of the town has changed um, as um, uh, it's grown and um, the need to uh, defend the town from um, uh, from the sea uh, has uh, has grown in association with that and then we've seen things like the development of the harbour but also the associated um, sea walls coming out from the harbour to uh, defend the uh, the town and effectively the town has um, has moved southwards has grown southwards as more land has been uh, been reclaimed both to um, accommodate growth and um, I'm sure other island islands uh, will also experience this particular challenge of disposal of um, solid waste um, in terms of uh, providing an option to deal with um, uh, inert waste that's generated. So I think the, uh, the issue of, of advance the line is, a, um, is an interesting um, notion here in, um, in, here in Jersey and we're looking at this in the context of the island plan review um, to address some of the, the drivers, not necessarily just related to climate change, but as I mentioned, also to look at this particular challenge of um, uh, what we do with our um, waste in the island and how we manage that within, within our own jurisdiction. Uh, but clearly it also brings with it some potential opportunities to look at um, potential uh, development options. As I mentioned at the outset, Jersey is a small place with a growing population. Uh, we have a sensitive coast and countryside um, and um, uh, looking at the historical growth of St Helier, uh, there's potential to consider um, future growth of the town through 
potentially further land reclamation into the uh, into the future. Um, clearly, that brings with it environmental implications. And uh, as part of that work, we would need to undertake a, a wider sustainability appraisal to look at the options of um, developing in the marine environment, uh, environment relative to uh, developing in the um, uh, in the terrestrial environment of the island. Um, so that's really the end of my uh, presentation, but hopefully that just provides you with a, uh, a brief oversight of this particular challenge in, uh, that we face in Jersey and our, uh, our particular uh, response to it. So I'll um, stop sharing my screen now and hopefully uh, join back with the, uh, the rest of you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I, I think that was really insightful in terms of the different challenges that you've got and particularly the range of development that you've got going from sort of marine and terrestrial and, and, and sort of the, the expanse to cover all of that. Um, Sue, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Um, if I may, that, I, I, uh, that was absolutely fascinating, Kevin. Thank you, thank you very, very much for that. And uh, a particular personal interest, because it's actually about 40 years since I used to visit Jersey on a regular basis. But I was always up at the top end, the north end. <laughs> so I was relieved to know that I was well away from any... <laughs> I do recall the massive tidal change that you actually experienced, which must you know, make things even more challenging um, in terms of how you manage things. But the one thing I was really, really impressed with was actually that the starting point and coming at it from this sort of climate change impact approach. And I thought the way you've got that graphic and you're putting it on the wall in St. Helier is absolutely what we need to do to start to get this in people's minds and get them to understand what's going on. So my real question, because it all sort of flows from that, which sense real question is how is your community engagement gone have you you've got that image on the wall so you're making things making people aware of you know what the context is but what sort of response are you getting to the shoreline plan and to the uh, the review that you're doing um well we've had um um really good um, uh, community engagement as part of the development of the shoreline management plan and also um, obviously as part of the island plan review we will go through that uh, that process as well so uh, some of the implications of the shoreline management plan will obviously land in the island plan and that's where uh, uh, obviously planning's at the, the sort of sharp end of that process um, but it's it's an interesting point that you raise in the sense that uh, you know because in in jersey and and i'm sure in the other islands um, we don't have this, um, perhaps the challenge that you have in the UK with uh, things like flood risk or, or along rivers, for example, where uh, communities might be exposed to the implications of flood risk for a long time after the event has happened. Um, you know, we see the tide come in and go out uh, a couple of times a day. Uh, and uh, if we get um, flooding, it tends to be very much a short term issue uh, in the sense it's, uh, it's a particular challenge at high tide. Um, uh, and um, it depends very much on the currently at the moment on the on the weather conditions as well. So the atmospheric pressure, uh, the wind direction as to how how severe the damage is, is felt and the level of disruption. So in terms of the community being aware of these issues, obviously we see it um, when we get a high tide. And you will have seen from some of the some of the slides that I showed, you know, you. you you can see it when we get a, a 40 foot tide in the island uh, and it, on, even on a still day, you could possibly um, lean down over the Harbour Quay in St Helier and possibly almost touch the top of the tide. Uh, so it's something that's in people's consciousness. Um, but um, uh, and interestingly, when we, whenever we do any sort of engagement about people's awareness of this particular challenge, um, you know, it's certainly coming up the uh, uh, sort of community's agenda in terms of the island's response to that. Um, in common with other places, our government have declared a climate emergency. So I think there is a, a, a recognition in, in, in the government and in the community that the island needs to uh, respond to these particular challenges. Um, and we have done some work around some of our coastal defences where um, uh, some of the walls have been raised. And it's you know, it's interesting. There's a um, there's particular challenges, obviously, for those um, islanders who are immediately adjacent to those um, those sea defences uh, in, in terms of impacting on things like their outlook, and um, uh, and so uh, and obviously that's sort of dealt with through the planning system. So there is this interesting sort of tension in terms of the uh, you know the responses to this to protect the wider community and then the impact that that does have on. Um, on individual um, islanders and their own their own property, so uh, it's certainly a live issue. 
Um, and um, we are developing a carbon neutral strategy as well. So again, there will be sort of implications coming out of that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, whilst Jersey is a small place, I think there is a recognition that, you know, we as a community need to make our own responses, both locally, but also to, to make a contribution to the, the sort of global challenge. So um, I, I think people recognise that there, there is a need to, to, you know, to respond to this in, in some way. No, that's really, really interesting. Thank you. I think it's lovely to see it knitting together. I think, you know, the, the forward projection epochs and then you know knitting it all together with the island plan as well I think it's very admirable um if we can move on to the second presentation please um it's going to cover climate change in Guernsey and the challenges of flooding um with a case study proposed for um is it Yields Yard Leals Yard thank you Leals Leals Yard yes so if Simone oh excellent well done thank you a two-hander here so Simone's got the slides and sharing the slides and I'm going to do a bit of talk over and then we'll join together um, in relation to questions if that's okay um, and we're, we're going to take you through a particular um, case study and it's of a, a site called Leal's Yard and that brings together a whole host of um, issues primarily related to um, flooding or, or focused on flooding but also the way in which flooding relates to other planning aspects and in the context of developing a, a, an underused um, site in a small island community. So the first slide that you've got there is to is to locate us. Um, that locates Guernsey just to the north of Jersey. Um, you see the two dots there down in the Bay of St. Malo, um, way off the English coast, much further, much closer to, uh, to France than to England. Um, and Guernsey has two main settlements. Um, it's got quite a, a widely distributed population, um, but the, the main focus of population, the highest densities are in St. Peterport, which is the main centre, the capital, if you like, capital town, um, and uh, St. Sampson, which is the northern um, secondary town, um, which is called the bridge, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, it's probably the, the opposite way around in terms of topography to uh, to Jersey. The, the west coast is low lying, um, but with a, a, a lower population density. But the north of the island is very low lying as well, and that's where the bridge is located. Um, so the, the spatial strategy that has been adopted by the states for quite a long time um, and is within a strategic land use plan, which was adopted back in 2011. Um, promotes development primarily within the main centres um, for sustainability reasons um, primarily. Um, and where, where we don't really have the option is to prevent development that is at risk from flooding um, in the sense that we are um, limited by our history in the way that the, the towns and, and the, um, the settlement patterns have developed over time. Um, and some of the constraints that, that arise from that are um, not particularly easy to overcome. So if we move on to the next one, Simone. You take us to the next slide, Simone. That slide okay? Can you move to the next one, please? Are we having a slight technical hitch? Ah, yeah. no, um, this is the one before that, sorry. Yeah. Is that working? We've got We've the got consultation for development yard. framework, but I was. Yeah, I've gone back to the um, extract of the IBP. Is that showing? Uh, no, not, not on mine, it's not. We've got a slide with Leal's Yard and the Bridge Main Centre. Ah, oh, right. An allocations okay. plan document. That's fine. That's not showing on mine. Apologies, but I'll talk to that one. Um, so, yes. Uh, oh, that's it. Now it is. <laughs> Must be a delay. Apologies. So, um, the Island Development Plan was adopted in 2016. Um, and this is a, a, a close up, really, of the, the bridge, as we call it, the, the St. Sampson's area. Um, it's actually split between St. Sampson and Vale parishes with Vale to the north. Um, so Leal's Yard regeneration areas in the centre. 
And what that shows really is it's an underused site, it's partially undeveloped, but it's got a legacy history of industrial use. So there's been um, some um, issues about pollution and so forth, which have to be addressed and, and some of them have been addressed. It lies to the rear of, um, if you can see a, a sort of darker blue um, to the east, um, and we're looking sort of, obviously it's north, south, east, west, um, to the east of it, there's a retail frontage on the bridge. And then the bridge harbour beyond that, which is designated as a harbour action area. So the scope again for enhancement. And again, that designation links in with the regeneration area. The purpose of the regeneration area obviously is to focus um, redevelopment um, on that um, underused brownfield site, which is actually the largest brownfield site in Guernsey. Now it's remained undeveloped obviously for, for a long period. It's had two um, major planning consents granted, one in 2009 for a retail-led scheme, which unhappily coincided with the global economic um, uh, crisis. So in terms of viability, that didn't proceed any further than um, effectively an outline planning permission. And then more recently, about four years ago, there was um, outline consent with some elements of detailed consent for a um, residentially led scheme. And that was looking at quite high density residential. And again, primarily for viability reasons, that one's failed to proceed further. So with the 2016 IDP, the Island Development Plan, um, that has now, um, as I say, been designated as a regeneration area. There is a requirement for a development framework um, to be adopted by the planning authority, which has been done, and a document was adopted in May this year. Um, and what that's looking to do is to um, provide the the, um, the foundation effectively for planning application to come forward for the site. Um, and recently, we've had pre-application discussions, which hopefully will lead to an application in the in the near future. Um, so, Simone, if you could. Move on to the next one, which is the um, consultation. Ah, excellent. Thank you. So this was um, the preparation of the development framework, um, and Simone was involved very closely in that. Um, and as it says there, early discussion with a range of stakeholders. And this was the first time really that we have gone out for um, pre-draft consultation on a policy document of this nature. Normally, um, a, a draft is prepared, consultations carried out on the draft. Um, and amendments are made prior to adoption of the, the final document. But in this case, um, working closely with con um, consultants, um, there was very early discussion, which elicited a, a whole range of responses from a, a very significant range of stakeholders. And that involved um, setting up uh, effectively a pop-up consultation shop on, on the bridge itself um, and discussing and, and seeking ideas from, you know, from the very young through to um, to to older people and everybody in between, which was an excellent way of um, getting ideas which fed directly into the um, into the document. So in that sense, it used traditional methods of engagement, um, actually sitting down and, and being open to um, people who would engage, but also um, actively proactively going out to um, schools and, and other um, establishments to uh, to elicit views from um, perhaps the harder to reach um, types of, uh, of, of groups and, and individuals. Subsequently though, and as a result of the, the COVID um, uh, crisis in, in the island and lockdown, which started in March, um, as the uh, development framework was um, went through it, its process, um, once a draft had been produced, there was another round of public consultation. Um, and that effectively coincided, the end of that period coincided with lockdown. So the um, the way in which the process moved on from there was very much set on a virtual um, platform. So through the committee, um, it was virtual meetings leading to adoption of the document in, in May. Um, and that was just before we actually came out of lockdown. So it was a very interesting experience. And um, in, in the future, we're looking at um, developing a similar process for the three regeneration areas that exist in St. Peterport. Um, and we are looking at virtual platforms to, to take those um, right from instigation right through that consultation process. So we are going to use some of the lessons that we learned as a result of COVID in the development of um, future projects of this nature. 
So the next one, Simone, if you don't mind. And this is a bit of a history lesson. So th this is why um, this site is so interesting and it, it's similar to some of the um, slides that, that Kevin showed of uh, St. Helier in a way, because um, this was from, this is the Duke of Richmond map of 1787. And in um, 1806, the then Lieutenant Governor for military reasons decided to drain what it what was a channel, the Bray de Val, which existed between two islands on Guernsey. There was a small island up to the northeast um, and the, the rest of the landmass, and that was divided by a, a waterway, a channel, which um, it was perceived might mean that if the French invaded at the time um, into the Northern Ireland, there would be issues and problems in, um, in defending the island and uh, getting men and militia and so forth and artillery um, across, the, across the divide which only had Le Grand Pont, which is the, the bridge, and that's where the name comes from for that settlement, um, to, uh, to link the two islands. So what, um, what, what Major General Doyle did was to drain, he actually um, built a wall effectively at the bridge end and built a large bank at the other end um, on the coast or near to the coast to the northwest and drained the land in between in, in a very significant engineering operation. Um, that land subsequently has been used for um, a range of developments, including industry, housing, and so on and so forth. But as you saw from the earlier slides, it forms um, a significant part of the settlement of um, St. Sampson or the bridge now. And this is why I'm saying that the, the historical development um, means that it's very difficult to um, not develop in those areas. So um, innovative and, and um, uh, ingenious methods need to be device to enable such development to, to proceed. In terms of the background um, in relation to flood risk, this is from the 2013 um, flood, flood risk strategy um, that was developed um, and it shows that this area of the bridge is, um, is vulnerable to over coastal flooding, overtopping of the, the wall effectively at the end of the harbour um, with potentially one in 10 year events and 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 more. Now this is where um, the, the the facts, if you like, from uh, or the empirical evidence doesn't necessarily coincide with everybody's recollection of the bridge as an area vulnerable to flooding. However, in the um, in the consultation on the development framework, there were recollections of people even within the Leals Yard site fishing. So clearly there have been flood um, flood events in the past, but they're not perhaps as common as this um, this graphic would indicate. But nevertheless, um, as with um, Jersey and uh, what was explained by Kevin, that there is a um, much greater public uh, and political um, understanding of the issues of climate change and the need to act um, wisely now, but also in the interest of, of the future as well. And this particularly comes to the fore in St. Sampson, because unlike St. Peterport, which is a hill town um, where there, there are some low lying areas on, on the immediate coast. Um, but St. Sampson, as you can see, is largely low lying, as I say, has a high population density, but it's also home to um, a number of industries. It's also home to the island's power station and also it's where the, um, the fuel um, arrives into the harbour at the moment. Um, so from a strategic point of view, um, it is extremely important and to lose any of those assets through flooding um, would have a, a catastrophic impact on island life for um, virtually everybody here. So this is an aerial photograph obviously of the bridge looking from the east, looking westward. And if you can imagine, if you if you carry on your eye from the bridge frontage westward, um, that would have been the Bray de Val in the past. So that would have been the um, would have been the waterway um, which runs through to almost the Vale Church to the to the west. So that's the low lying area that we're talking about. And you can see where it says site. That's where the Leals Yard site is over to the um, to the right hand side. We've got um, part of the power station, which actually extends further to the um, to the north as well to the right of the picture. We've got um, a boat yard there um, in front of the power station. We've got various large sheds which are indicative of industry. Um, we've got a, a small marina in that um, in that pool there as well. 
and all around that area to the um, to the south, to the to the left of the picture, and in front um, the bridge frontage. That's retail, um, and that's the sort of core of the um, settlement there of St Sampson, which does um, it is a very highly used um, uh, settlement, and um, it, it's almost. Um, a community focus, probably more so than St Peterport, because there's, there's a sort of dropping culture, which we'll see some of the evidence of that in a minute when we go on to um, the issue of parking and uh, vehicular access, because people do like to sort of drive quite close to the shops, park, pop in for their sandwiches or whatever, and then and then depart. And so it's got that sort of feel to it. Um, but as a community hub, um, it largely works very well and is very popular. So in, in terms of um, the sort of uh, um, opportunities there, it's obviously it's, it's waterfront. Um, you can see there's been some development of a small arena, so there's there's elements of that. Um, but also you can probably see from the aerial photograph in front of the site to the to the east of the site, um, you can see a large roadway there, which is part of the Inter Harbour route, um, takes a vast amount of traffic on an relatively speaking for the island. Um, and it does create a very car dominated um, public realm, which is of poor quality. It's not pedestrian friendly. Um, it's not cyclist friendly. And it obviously is the, the, the very frontage where the um, greatest impact potentially of flooding may take place. Now, in the past, the approaches to this particular site under previous planning policies um, really looked at the site in isolation. So, um, where development was previously approved, it was on the basis effectively of protecting that development from flood risk, potentially trying to ameliorate adverse impacts on adjoining uses or, or neighbouring uses as as, um, as part of that, but not particularly looking comprehensively at the island's um, flooding issues, particularly in that area, um, in conjunction with the development. And effectively what's happened is that the, um, the, the states through their flood risk strategy have looked fairly independently at measures that might be um, put in place for this particular area. Um, it's the top priority, um, as it says there, thank you, Simone, um, identified the bridge as number one priority for action for the reasons that I've really explained about its strategic um, importance and the, the density of population, but also the power station, etc. And the states, um, the project team dealing with that was really um, moving forward in isolation from other um, aspects in developing a, a um, proposed solution. Now, there were a number of options considered, which ranged from um, doors um, on the outer harbour, effectively gates to um, prevent uh, surge tidal surges and uh, i think as uh, as was said i think sue said, talked about the tidal range in the channel islands I mean, in guernsey it's 33 feet tidal range which is 10 roughly 10 meters which is um is, is enormous um and coupled with climate change as kevin's referred to the the implications are extremely um extremely serious so the states, uh, as I say, um, considered a number of options and eventually through a whole process of consultation and, um, and political involvement came down on a um, progressing a fairly pragmatic solution, which was to put a fairly low wall um, at the midpoint of the large road roadway that, that you saw on the previous slide. So in the central reservation effectively and the feeling that that coupled with higher points, um, naturally higher points at either side of the bridge would provide a, um, a certain amount of resilience, at least in the short term, while long, longer term um, strategic approaches were being developed. And, and that was in the previous schemes um, looked at as, as the way potentially to have a, a more comprehensive approach to flood risk issues. Now, however, um, there's been a step, excuse me, a step change in the approach um, because through the island development plan and through the requirement for a development framework, there are opportunities to look far more broadly at the whole issue of flood risk um, to integrate that with other aspects which um, are particularly um, relevant to the bridge. So, for example, the, the public realm issues, the, the parking and access aspects of the of the environment in that area and to come up with a, um, a comprehensive approach which integrates 
all of those things, but also enables development of that site, which obviously is a, a valuable site um, within the main centre um, and where development really would be um, will be promoted through the planning system. So what we've looked at is to pull all those issues, coastal defence, um, design, public realm, public safety um, th through the planning process, through the policies um, and looking at the material considerations of our planning law um, together. And then that that is um, fo a focus of the development framework and there, therefore a focus of the um, discussions with potential developers of the site. Um, so we're looking at a, a much wider approach um, from the re regeneration area, which ties all of those issues together. It goes beyond the boundary of the regeneration area um, and uh, into the um, harbour action area as well. So there's other policy designations which assist us to um, to integrate these issues. Uh, one of the aspects which I should probably have mentioned about um, the the flood risk on this site, it's not just to do with overtopping um, from the seaward side it's also because of its low-lying nature it's got issues of a high groundwater um, level on the site so much of the site is lower than the high tide level um, much of the site is lower actually some one to two meters lower than roadways on either side so it is it's effectively a basin um, with a low groundwater table which is uh, probably fairly uniquely, I think, subject to tidal range as well, because um, studies have shown that the the wall, which um, which was built back in the um, 19th century, um, has some permeability. So when the tide rises, the water permeates through the wall. So it, um, it adds to the the issues of groundwater flooding on on the on the site. So any development on that site needs to deal with a whole range of complex flood uh, related issues and one of the things that they can do on the on the site itself obviously is through um, a suds approach um, which looks at um, a, a range of things and it links in with the, a fundamental requirement in the development framework which is to provide a minimum area of um, effectively public open space um, both to um, enhance the public realm to enhance the um, site as a community focus but also to do, help to deal with issues relating to flooding so what you can see here is a graphic from the development framework um, which looks at suds approach it looks at reels it looks at um, you know water attenuation um, on the site in order to hold it and enable it to be um, uh, removed from the site um, at lower tide or when the when the rainfall event has ended and that might involve pumping to the um, out to the harbour which obviously is, is close by so that, that potentially is a strength in relation to site location but in terms of resilience of the built environment um, there's options to do with raised walkways there's a, a clear need to um, prevent um, bedroom accommodation for example on the ground floor of buildings so the design of buildings on the site would be um, a matter to be addressed um, as, as, a, as a core requirement within the framework. Um, various ways in which the built development and the development of the site in both a natural and, and built sense will need to respond to the constraints and, and potentially some of the opportunities of the location of this particular site in relation to flooding. Uh, so if we can move on. We move to the next one, Simone, please. Yep. Hi. Sorry, I got you. Lovely. Thank you. So th this and the next slides show two options um, which have been developed and, and are il illustrated in the development framework. The first one. Um, relates to um, effectively the, the pragmatic solution which has been developed through the state's um, side of things since 2013. Um, and this is the, the wall that I mentioned um, through the central reservation of that, what is at the moment a large roadway um, across the bridge. And bear in mind that, as I say, it's part of the inter-island route, so it takes large volumes and also quite heavy traffic. But what this seeks to do um, in conjunction with development of the site behind is to um, adapt the parking area which currently exists in front of the retail properties along the, the bridge frontage, um, reduce parking there, 
there's a requirement in the brief to or in the framework to um, provide some compensatory parking within the development site itself. Um, but this is a this is a, a sort of first step um, adaptation, if you like, which tries to improve the public realm. Um, it takes into consideration the um, potential overtopping and flood risk, um, and it, um, it it seeks to um, reduce the car domination. It provides a smaller pedestrian area um, or a small pedestrian area, and it provides opportunities for spill out space to the fronts of um, of retail properties there. And it also will be a first step potentially in the wider regeneration of that area as part of the harbour action area. And if you remember from the aerial photograph with the boat yard and the other um, sort of industrial uses around the, the area, um, it's hoped that development of Leal's Yard and its integration um, with public realm improvements will provide a catalyst to, um, to promote further redevelopment over time, which will significantly enhance that, that bridge centre. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we could move to the second one, please. Thank you very much. So this this is a second option, and this one would run the wall um, around the um, a parapet wall effectively on the seafront there. Um, again, taking advantage of the slightly higher um, land levels at either side of the bridge, but using raised tables to um, provide resilience at, at either end. Um, but by increasing the height of the wall um, and fundamentally reducing the amount of um, parking in front of the um, bridge properties there, it would greatly enhance the pedestrian area. It would significantly enhance the um, user friendliness of the area from the point of view of pedestrian cyclists uh, and more vulnerable road users so it, it links together to show that what can be achieved um, and in conjunction with development of the site as i say hopefully that will provide a catalyst um, for change um, but also it, it, the, the whole um, understanding and um, appreciation of flood risk as an issue potentially itself would be a driver for change because fundamentally things need to change, things need to happen. Um, and if we can demonstrate through work such as this, that actually what will come out of it will be a significant enhancement for everybody's appreciation and enjoyment of, um, of what is a um, successful and potentially thriving um, community centre within Guernsey. Um, and if everybody can be on the same page as it were in relation to those objectives, then we stand a much better chance of achieving that change within a shortest um, or shorter period of time. So really to, to, to wrap it up, really, it's that those sorts of messages that emerge from this case study for us that um, while it is obviously a challenge and this area of the island, it, that has particular challenges re regarding um, flood um, flood risk. It can be a positive driver for change. It's um, it's really incumbent on the planning system to bring together um, a range of diverse parties who might be engaged in parts of the process, but to deal with that on a comprehensive basis. And the planning um, system through means such as the island development plan and in this case development frameworks provides um, the tools to enable that to happen. Um, as I hope I've demonstrated, this is a complex site with a great many factors. There, there's others which I've not mentioned here for, for time purposes, but it, 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 is a, it is a particularly complex site. Um, that's part of the reason it hasn't been developed successfully in the past, but also um, viability, global economic conditions, etc., have played a um, significant part in that. Um, but fundamentally, it's important that the site itself is not considered in isolation, as has been the case in the past. But now it's um, been seen as part of a coordinated and holistic approach, making the most of the opportunities and doing um, the very best to overcome the constraints and, and the challenges. Um, we clearly have relied on legislation, as I say, and the planning policies to um, seek to to achieve an integrated and wider holistic approach in this particular case and that will um, feed into other work that we're doing as I mentioned we're doing similar exercises now we're starting similar work in St Peterport um, for the regeneration areas there 
Um, and the key in this particular case, because of the, um, the viability issues, the scale of the development and the challenge is to front load through the planning process and do our best to make sure that everybody is on the same page. And if we're all seen as pulling in the same direction, we've got the best chance of delivering positive change through planning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim and Simone. I think it's interesting to see the conflict between sustainability as traditionally approached and flood risk. I guess the greater risk of area being affected, the more innovative the solutions that are required. Um, Sue, have you got any questions you want to ask? Um, just to say that was absolutely fascinating and what none of you probably knew, but it's actually between already with, with Kevin's presentation, you've actually brought together so many of the themes that have actually run through my own career because I started off as a physical geographer doing hydrology and climate change. And then I went into planning and all the time I've sort of looked at these relationships and to see them articulated in such an, a positive way is just so, so impressive. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it also gave me an insight into a different part of Guernsey. I've got uh, an aunt in St. Peterport and I must admit, I really hadn't looked at the St. Samson area in the way that we've just gone through it. And particularly the history I found really interesting in the way you'd originally got two islands. Immediately, it reminded me of a similar position that the uh, challenge that the Isle of Wight, another island is facing between the sort of the west side and the main island, where again, they've got a river valley that is below sea level. Uh, so it's, there's so much there that I thought fascinating. But what really came through was the value of planning in dealing with a range of issues in an integrated way. And that, uh, I think you used the word holistic, and it's the absolutely the right word, the holistic approach to addressing the challenges uh, and responding to both opportunities and constraints and looking outside of the box. So if I can just pose a really short question, because I know we're quite tight on time. Really interested in the community engagement that you did and really interested in the way um, you reached out to such a diversity of people there before you got hit by the COVID difficulties. And you'd mentioned that previously two schemes hadn't come forward. What was different in the community engagement that perhaps prompted you to look, and was it that, that prompted you to look in that more, um, take that step back, more holistic way, looking at the harbour areas, et cetera, as, and bringing it all in? I'll ask Simone to come in on the community engagement, the development framework, because she was there on the ground throughout. Um, but in relation to the previous schemes, because I was in, involved in those and effectively there was minimal um, community engagement. One, one of the changes that we've made to the planning system is to um, move more to development frameworks. And in the past, Lille's Yard was subject to what was originally called an outline planning brief and then changed to a local planning brief when our current planning law came in. Um, but what that involved was a um, quite a policy document that went to the states of deliberation, went to our island government for adoption, um, and it did actually go through a, a planning inquiry prior to going to the states. But because of the nature of the processes involved, it probably was largely unnoticed by um, large parts of the population and particularly the people who would use the bridge on a regular basis. Um, so people who are engaged more with the political side of the process were probably highly aware what was going on. But in relation to the person in the street, it, it probably had very little relevance at that point. And it wasn't until a planning application came in and people got more engaged with what was going on. But obviously by that point, it's largely too late. And as it happens, as I say, it, it, primarily the global economic conditions meant that those schemes didn't proceed. But actually, we, we missed such a, an, an, you know, vital part of the process by by that mechanism. The development frameworks are quite different, and I'll let Simone um, explain what happened with that, if I may. Yeah, yeah, sure, Jim. I'm just going to echo what you said and say that you know it's such a key part um, um, of value that you add by starting the discussion or the conversation early with the community and letting them know what steps you're going to take. So as Jim said, they weren't aware until the planning application went in and it was very late in the process for them before. This time we started right at the start, telling them what was happening, getting them involved and thinking about their centre in a different way. So they came in with a particular issue. Uh, sometimes it would be parking. It is quite a popular issue here, but they would then start talking to one of us on the team and thinking about wider things to do with the centre and 
about the positives as well as the negatives. And it was a very, it was a very enjoyable actual consultation exercise from that point of view, because you came away with people learning more about their centre and wider, and adding value to what what came through in the document. Thank you. Back back to you, Dawn. Thank you very much for that. Apologies, Thank I was you. the one getting stuck with the mute button. Um, if you can visualise now just leaving the Channel Islands, getting on a boat or a plane or both, um, and just flitting over now to the Isles of Scilly, we're going to get our third and final um, presentation on the challenges of fitting um, Scilly into national planning policy and a case study on smart islands. So if I can hand over please to Lisa. Yes, thank you. I will just try and share my screen if you bear with me. <laughs> hmm. Hang on. Screen two. Hmm. Perfect, we've got that up now. Okay. Now I just need to bring my notes <laughs> so I can see what I'm saying. Hang on. Where did I get the notes I've got from? It's up. I don't know what I'm doing. Hang on. Why can't I see my notes? I can't see my notes. Hang on. Oh, this worked when I tested it earlier. If you run the presentation on one screen and project it on the second. Yeah, that's what, that's what, it's, ah, sorry. God, my notes won't come up. Uh, where's that gone? Don't, don't worry because the image is absolutely fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> this is dark. Yeah. Right. If you pull over that screen onto your other screen. There we go. It's just still not quite right. Where's that gone? Sorry. If you like, Lisa, I could share my screen and transition the slides and then you can have your notes up. Mm -hmm. um, Would that be helpful? Yeah, I must my work. Oh, so right, okay. So here we go. Um, can you all see that slide? That's okay. Yes, perfect. So, so firstly, thank you, Charlotte, Dawn, Sue, and the RTPI for inviting the Council of the Isles of Scilly along to today's virtual visit of the RTPI to the islands of the Southwest region. So yes, my name's Lisa Walton, and I'm the senior planning officer, and I manage the planning service here on Scilly. So we are small. Um, and we have lots of issues and they don't have easy solutions. And I suspect we have many uh, commonalities, um, as I've heard, with uh, with my counterparts in Jersey and Guernsey. So I'm going to set a bit of a, a context, as, as most people don't really know much about the Isles of Scilly. We're a, a tiny archipelago off the coast of Cornwall. We comprise five inhabited islands. It's rural, sparsely populated environment. That's about 137 people per square kilometre compared to 153 per square kilometre in Cornwall and 353 per square kilometre in England, if you exclude London. So we're a very small population of around 2,300 people, and they mainly reside on the main island of St Mary's. We currently have a... I'm not... Are my slides moving? They're not, are they? We've got facts about Silly now. So that's the slide I've just read, sorry. Um, uh, so we currently have a trend that shows a declining population. Um, in assessing the future housing needs of the islands, we also have a trend that shows an increasing ageing population. We have a greater number of households living in privately rented accommodation than in Cornwall or in England and Wales, who are less likely to own their own home. The review of the local plan has provided up-to-date information on the housing profile of the islands and, and key findings confirmed many of the collective assumptions uh, to be true, including much higher house prices than on the mainland, a lower wage economy, a low availability of owner-occupied housing and limited access to affordable housing. So additionally, the, the Isles of Scilly ranks eighth highest among local authorities in England for fuel poverty and the proportion of households considered to be fuel poor in 2016 was 15.5% against the English average of 11.1 and the South West average being 10.2. Um, so the islands have unique ownership, which means uh, that the development potential is limited and in an area of um, the compared to an area of wider and wider range of landowners, um, the islands have specific environmental um, heritage and cultural assets with associated levels of high protection. So 238 scheduled monuments, that's 
38 scheduled monuments per square mile compared to 2.5 square mile nationally and, and 13 per, per square mile in the southwest. We have 128 listed buildings, that's 20 per square mile compared to 7.5 nationally and, and 8 per square mile in the southwest. We also have 26 triple SIs, registered parks and uh, one registered park and garden. Um, we are a special area of conservation. Um, we are a marine conservation zone. We have special protection area. Um, in 2018, there was a consultation on proposed marine expansion to this designation. The islands include Ramsar wetlands, which provide further protection for migratory bird species. So there are a number of, a number of nationally and internationally important numbers of protected species, including breeding seabirds, wading birds, birds of prey, species of bats and mammals. Um, so there are lots of constraints and challenges. Um, so coming on to the planning context, so that the, the post-war period experienced the most rapid and far-reaching period of change to the built environment in the island's history. So this was a result of the rapidly rising demand for visitor accommodation and visitor facilities and the, the post-war boom in holidays and travel. So there was a surge of new buildings and the result, result in some parts of the island at least is a very dense form of development. And I think what you can see in that slide there um, is public housing, um, post-war public housing that completely obscures the garrison wall, which is a, a grade one listed building and a scheduled monument, which is running behind all those houses there. Um, the reaction, the islands were designated a conservation area in 1975 and in 1976 were designated an area of outstanding natural beauty and defined as a heritage coast. So we see this big reaction in a bid to save or protect the islands from further rapid development. And these tools have been the underpinning guard, if you like, to stop similar rapid development in the future and remain one of the most effective tools at protecting the island from development pressure. To balance the success and strength of these designations, there have been successive plans and economic strategies since with varying degrees of success. So there does, uh, there does remain, however, only modest amounts of development annually when you balance the constraints against the potential harm in addition to addressing sustainable development issues. And it can tip the balance of viability. So this is, there's, al there's also this bit of, we can't have everything, particularly for development projects where margins are small. It either looks nice because Scilly is a special place and, and development has to be in keeping, or it's sustainable and we can't have both. But we don't get much large scale development pressure and we're slowly changing mindsets about the need to capture small changes and, and deliver both high quality, long term, lasting, long lasting, sustainable development. And we, we've been working on a new local plan since 2015. So the last local plan prior to this was adopted in 2005 and it doesn't always provide clear or, or tangible policy expectations. So the emerging local plan does try and address this. And when you need to renew, upgrade, build new homes and support economic diversification, the constraints have to serve as a positive tool, particularly when you don't have economies of scale and achieving sustainable high quality. When construction is already 50 percent higher, than it, then it's a challenging set of circumstances. Um, so I hope I've established and set a picture that the Isles of Scilly are unique. And from a planning perspective in particular, whilst we fall into the normal legislative and policy frameworks as the rest of the UK, we, we certainly don't fit into the current growth agenda. And, and I think that's really important considering the, the upcoming planning changes. So that growth agenda of, of national planning policy currently is extremely difficult to address all of the 12 core planning principles as fully as the MPPF require and, and as the guidance expects when the scale of development and development pressure is, is so very small and the constraints are so big. So yes, there are big changes to come, but this isn't a presentation on, on the quite radical changes the government's currently consulting on, and I won't go into the detail. These suffice to say, we do recognise the quite significant impacts that these could have on the Isles of Scilly. Um, but moving forward, we have to address climate change. And as of October 2019, the Council of the Isles of Scilly signed up to a declaration of a climate emergency um, with a commitment 
for the authority to be carbon neutral by 2030. The council is therefore committed to and encouraging and engaging with its partners and other local businesses and organisations to adopt similar ambitions to become carbon neutral in the next 10 years. So to reflect this commitment, it's important that development proposals demonstrate a sustainable approach in terms of design, construction and occupation of a, on a proportionate basis. So whilst the islands have always been exposed to storms, the effects of climate change as um, we've seen in Jersey and Guernsey are likely to become more frequent, more severe. We don't have um, island rivers, but so bringing risk of flooding, coastal flooding, damage to building and livelihoods, pollution of drinking water and changes in climate not only make the community physically vulnerable, but it can also have devastating consequences for the natural environment with many of our designated sites could be irreversibly changed. So the local plan not only um, reflects on the past and where we've come from, but sets out an ambitious, ambitious vision, which includes that by 2030, we see innovative systems and technologies which take advantage of the island's location and environment and provide a catalyst for achieving exemplary and innovative sustainable development, uh, providing a model for how other communities around the world can function. And we see, we see the island's infrastructure as a beacon of sustainability for the UK and beyond, providing an affordable and innovative low carbon model for managing energy, water and waste with considerable benefits to the environment and the residents' quality of life. So how do we achieve this? <laughs> so as I've highlighted already, the scale of the islands means development pressure is limited. And because of this, most developments that come forward are relatively small scale and the benefits we're able to achieve are on a small scale. But many small changes can make a big difference. So since giving weight to the new local plan, it's now a requirement to demonstrate on a proportionate basis, sustainability improvements in both new builds and extensions, including improved water consumption standards. Biodiversity net gains, so not just trying to remove harm, but effectively increase habitats and demonstrating how short term and long term waste is, is to be managed. So these are now submitted with most planning applications or, or agreed as pre-commencement conditions. Running parallel to the small is the more ambitious and in 2016 um, a partnership arrangement was established between the public and private sector and the council together with the Duchy of Cornwall, the main landowner, Tresco Estate, Islands Partnership, um, the Isles of Silic Community Venture and partner company Hitachi Europe, they established the Smart Islands Partnership and this programme that aims to sustainably and affordably tackle the Isles of Scilly's main climate change issues, including infrastructure utilities and local transport needs, whilst providing the social benefits such as cheaper energy, skills, training and e-health solutions. Um, so Smart Island seeks to establish the use of smart grid technology as a sustainable way to improve energy provision, reduce costs and support the local economy. And it aims to do this by um, achieving 40% of electricity from renewable sources, 40% of all vehicles to be electric or low carbon and addressing fuel poverty. But the partnership is more ambitious. I, I won't talk a lot about um, the, the details of this, but it's also looking into the future with plans to understand energy from waste, energy from wave, wave and tidal power and opportunities for testing things like e-health solutions in the southwest and, and collaboration with universities in the region. And finally, the, 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 the project supports many local businesses to improve their energy efficiency through a business energy efficiency scheme for grants. Um, we've seen a large increase in both the permitted development of solar panels on buildings and an increase in the number of applications made to install panels. And the council has supported the project through its, applica its own application to install 27 electric vehicle charging points around the islands connected to the electricity network of Western Power which will generate at least 40 kilowatts of renewable energy. Electric vehicle charging points help those who want to meet and um, to invest in electric vehicle in the future. And Smart Energy Islands is the first programme of Smart Islands Partnership, and it aims to deliver not only smart grid to manage the island's energy demands and supply, but also improve business productivity by reducing energy, install solar panels on council owned homes and, and, uh, um, and sites, and um, as well as improving efficiency and install almost 450 kilowatts of solar PV.
in and around the islands, which I think is enough to pa enough power to meet the en annual energy needs of 50 homes on the islands. So whilst developing the local plan, we've worked to reflect the small islands ambitions and set out a balance of considerations that enables the right support to be given whilst protecting our delicate and outstanding environment using positive planning tools and the lessons of the past to make a positive and sustainable future. So local plan seeks to provide a positive framework to continue to develop a sustainable long-term future that balances the needs of the island communities with protecting and enhancing its um, important natural assets. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you, Lisa. I'm just gonna get my stop sharing. That's still sharing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. My goodness. I was going <laughs> to say for a small island, you know how to pack in the constraints. <laughs> um, it's it's nice to see that like you don't need a few people responding to climate change perfectly, but lots of people responding to it imperfectly. And it's good to see that there's some mindsets changing on the island. Hmm. Um, Sue, did you have any questions for Lisa? Um, yeah, thank you, so, Lisa. Thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. I've never been to Scilly. <laughs> I will say that. And like Jersey and Guernsey, I've never been to Scilly. I've always wanted to come to the Scilly Islands. And I've watched quite a few programmes that have given me that sort of picture of this, the, the place that you've really well described as well and put a bit more sort of flesh on the bones. So really, really interesting. Particularly struck one SSSI per 100 people. I mean, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And the same with the scheduled monuments. I did a quick count. That was one every 10 people. And that really, to me, suddenly just sort of your, your comparison translated the constraints that you actually face. And I think also the picture you painted of an area where you're at, you haven't got development pressure, you have got an aging population, you have got you know, perhaps a deep, well, depopulation generally. It, it's a really different scenario to that that everyone else works it with. And very, very much struck by the talk, the bit you talked about with the Smart Island Partnership. And really, my, my question on that is, it, you talked about the sort of key stakeholders who are engaged. What about how are the community involved in that? Where's their voice? Because those small steps require you inevitably to get the community to actually do part of that delivery. So it's really how are they part of it? Yeah, I mean, it, it is um, a challenging um process to get the community on board but the, the consultation events that my colleagues have have done so when when they did the electric vehicle so there's an electric vehicle car share scheme and the installation of car sh um, electric vehicle charging points around the islands and solar canopies which um these would sit under on in a lot of sites these also include solar canopies and there was a big community engagement partly um when we were doing the local plan consultation sometimes not but they they did get a lot of interest from people who engaged in that process. I mean, it doesn't always reflect in the, you know, when we got planning application in and and, and the, the views that come out versus that that consultation where, you, you know, you, a lot of positive people come forward and are very positive about it as a project. Um, so it is a battle and it is a difficult um, issue to address because car ownership in particular is a big problem like probably on Jersey and Guernsey that it, it, you know trying to reduce cars is a big thing and that's what people who do come to the islands they say they're kind of not expecting they're expecting a sort of 1950s oldie worldy place and then when you see all the cars that that are here it's it's kind of a bit of a shock so people are interested in ways we can reduce things like vehicles on the islands and are interested in in being more sustainable um but it's, it's, it's a difficult balance between then what we get in when we've actually got a planning application in and we've got like, you know, 12 planning applications all coming in at the same time that all of a sudden drop all these electric vehicle charging points. And the views the, the that then come in is like, whoa, well, we don't have that many electric vehicles. Why do we need all these electric charging points? So it is a is a, a, a sort of um, getting the right people engaged and getting ev trying to get everyone engaged. So it is a, a, a process of working with the community and 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 communicating that to them about what it is we're trying to achieve and what our um what the smart islands project tries to achieve and yeah it is it is a battle <laughs> it's, 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 it's one that you're obviously facing and tackling really really positively it's fascinating mm. really interesting thank you okay. <laughs>
Brilliant. Um, I was just going to ask if anyone's got any further questions before we do any concluding comments. No, I know we're running quite tight for time. So um, Sue, did you want to do any concluding comments? I think just really to say thank you all so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Lisa, for, for those tours. And whilst we live in this strange world that means we use virtual media to sort of communicate and it, it actually gives that wonderful opportunity to travel what's probably a thousand miles today just in in an hour so thank you so much really really interesting lovely and i, I just wanted to include to say thank you to all of the speakers and sue mans for attending the whistle stop tour of the channel islands and the isles of silly um i think it was really interesting to understand the opportunities and constraints of the island living and how implications for climate change and flood risk are being considered in the evolution of the local plans and the innovative measures that are being considered to address these. But thank you very much, everyone, for all of your time. And thank you, Sue, for attending. And, and thank you, Dawn, for chairing. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Can thank I you. just get a um, group photo? So I'm just going to print the screen. So if I just get you all looking at the camera and smiling, I'm just going to take a group photo. Try, well, <laughs> <laughs> Try and look happy. Yeah. <laughs> some chaps quickly paste it yeah i've got it brilliant thank you fantastic thank you charlotte for organizing everything as well <laughs> that's okay so i'll put this on uh, youtube and we'll sort of put it out into our newsletters so other people can sort of come and watch and sort of understand what's going on uh, in your islands and things so they might actually come direct to, to you with questions in due course so do be prepared for that but i'll let you know once it's on youtube if you want to share it out to your uh, wider colleagues as well and, and just to add to that, one of the things I'll be doing is putting up a LinkedIn post as soon as Charlotte sends me the link to the YouTube. I'll put up a LinkedIn post. Please connect and then we can get it spread out as widely as we can. Uh, at the moment, the regional visits, when they go up on LinkedIn, I'm getting sort of three and a half thousand, four thousand views and they always connect to the YouTube, which is brilliant. I bet this one will get even more. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very much, much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.